I'm Rodney Eric Lopez, and I stand for generosity, faith, and service. I'm on a mission to help people create a healthier relationship with their money by placing giving at the center of their financial lives. Welcome to The Generosity Solution, a show where I'll examine some of the barriers to abundant living and how to overcome them. Welcome to The Generosity Solution. I'm your host, Rodney Eric Lopez. On September 11, 2001, I was awakened by a telephone ring. My friend called and she was relieved to hear that I had picked up. She wanted to make sure I was nowhere near downtown Manhattan because there was a terrible explosion at the World Trade Center and thousands of people were being evacuated out of the area. I thanked her for checking in on me. What she didn't know at the time, and I didn't know until I turned on the TV a few minutes later, was that it wasn't a simple explosion. It was something much worse. The 9-11 tragedy brought to the United States and to New York City specifically what Americans had taken for granted was only possible in distant countries. The ability of large numbers of citizens to be killed or harmed in an act of terror. For years, those were the kinds of images we only saw on news reports from foreign lands. Now it had come to our soil, and our world has been forever changed. On the days after the attack, I saw something that I had never seen before and really haven't seen again since. It was the kind of spirit and emotion that is only accessible when one's heart has been broken open and the raw vulnerability and sadness of a people are exposed. As soon as the crowds were evacuated, thousands of New Yorkers made their way to what eventually was called Ground Zero to try and help the first responders with the wreckage. In the hours and days that followed, people donated blood, supplies, money, whatever they could to assist with the rescue effort. Eventually, people had to be turned away as the area was unsafe for anyone who wasn't certified to be there. Beyond the World Trade Center site, though, something else was happening. As telephone poles, subway walls, and stores hung pictures of missing loved ones, an outpouring of empathy and compassion filled the streets of New York. New York City, teased for being tough, dirty, and rude, was an epicenter of love. Complete strangers talked, hugged, and cried together on the streets. Conversations, prayer circles, and candlelight vigils took place on random corners. A generosity of spirit blanketed the entire city as we mourned the thousands of people who'd been taken from us on that day and wondered together about our collective future. Unfortunately, the genuine sense of human connectedness gave way to the anger of having been attacked, and our political leaders sounded the drumbeat of war. While I never expected that connection to last forever, I felt a second mourning as news reports transitioned from stories of mutual support to stories of retaliation, weapons of mass destruction, and shopping as a way to defeat the terrorists. Americans have a great capacity for generosity. We show up in a big way when tragedy strikes, hurricanes, earthquakes, and other natural and man-made disasters. Donations flow in the hundreds of millions. Volunteers roll up their sleeves to rebuild communities, and supplies come from all over to be distributed to those in need. How do we practice generosity during our normal, everyday lives, though, when there isn't a present crisis to deal with? Well, there's good news there, too. Giving USA, which publishes an annual report on philanthropy, announced some encouraging numbers last year. American individuals, estates, foundations, and corporations contributed over $390 billion to U.S. charities in 2016. That's a lot of money. What's great is that giving grew in all of the most significant areas. According to the Giving USA report, Giving to all nine major categories of recipient organizations grew, making 2016 just the sixth time in the past 40 years that this occurred. The nine categories are religion, education, human services, giving to foundations, health, public society, arts, culture, and humanities, international affairs, and environment and animals. Is your giving counted in that $390 billion? Was there a cause, charity, or organization you gave to last year? While there are tax incentives associated with charitable contributions, I'd like to think most people give because they're motivated by wanting to make a difference and feel strongly about a particular cause or mission. 
Also, research shows that individual giving is tied to other economic factors, including personal consumption, disposable income, and even the S&P 500 index. I believe, no, in fact I know, that giving does more than just make you feel good. Although if that were the only reason, that would be enough. It also does more than help the recipients. Giving, especially when done intentionally as a practice, has a profound impact on your finances and unleashes abundance in your life. Now, what do I mean by practice? Well, there are certain behaviors that over time have a major impact on your life and health. For instance, brushing your teeth once does absolutely nothing for your oral health. But a practice of regular brushing over a lifetime does. Going to the gym once has no impact on your fitness. But a regular fitness routine, even a modest one, does wonders for your physical and mental health. Giving is a muscle that can be developed also. Just like the person who starts with a light 10-minute walk before graduating to serious interval training, we can start donating to causes we believe in modestly, in very small amounts, until we become philanthropists in our own right. Now, why should that even be a goal? I submit that when we adopt an intentional giving practice, we become masters of our financial affairs and create the room to receive beautiful gifts that the universe has to offer. There's a growing body of generosity research that examines the motivations and impacts of individual giving. It's interesting stuff and I completely geek out over it. One research effort aimed at examining the giving patterns and motivations of American Christians. In their book, Passing the Plate, professors Christian Smith, Michael Emerson, and Patricia Snell dug into a ton of data, including government, private, and denominational sources, and had some interesting insights. While many in this group acknowledge the importance of giving, the vast majority simply don't give to their potential. Why does this matter? Well, by their conservative estimates of American Christians could somehow find a way to move to practices of reasonably generous giving, they could generate, over and above what they currently give, a total of another $133.4 billion a year. The good in the world that could be achieved is almost unimaginable, simply astonishing nearly beyond comprehension. What's interesting about their findings is that it wouldn't take lavish, sacrificial giving to achieve this kind of result. It would simply take intentional, practiced giving to generate the kinds of resources that could be put to incredible use outside the strictures of government. While this research is focused on one subset of the population, I believe that its implications are universal. If everyone, regardless of background, could develop giving practices and organize that giving locally, we could fund incredible movements and causes. What prevents us from doing so? The professors offer a number of hypotheses. We'll dive deeper into them in another episode, but here's a partial view of their list. See if one or more of these describe how you think about financial giving. One, despite American affluence generally, many Americans simply don't possess the discretionary financial resources to give, given how many fixed costs we have. Two, most people don't give their money generously because they simply don't perceive the legitimate needs that their money could address and meet. Three, most people don't give their money generously because they're suspicious of waste and abuse by nonprofit administrators, especially those with access to too much surplus wealth. Four, most people don't give because matters of personal and family finance are highly private in our culture, removing giving from public discussion and accountability. And five, giving tends to be occasional and situational, not a consistent, structured, routine practice. Do any of these resonate with you? Are there other reasons that you can think of? Chip Conley, the founder of the Joie de Vivre hotel chain said, being a giver is not good for a hundred yard dash, but it's valuable in a marathon. When I can step back from the hustle of my daily life, I can perceive the marathon of my life, but if I'm not careful, I can just see it as a series of 100-yard dashes. When I was at a place in my life where I was struggling financially, I felt really stuck. I wasn't making much, and I was cashing checks because for a long time, I didn't want to open another bank account. The ones I had had been seized. I was what the financial industry calls unbanked. If someone had come to me at that time and said the way to get out of this situation is to start giving, I would have said, you're crazy, give what? Well, that's actually what happened. I attended a church that issued a giving challenge and that was exactly the message. Giving is the start of financial peace. And that was exactly my response. No, that sounds like a scam. 
From a place of complete skepticism, I accepted this giving challenge. And you know what? It was the beginning of financial peace. Would you like to know more about it? Do you have a story about how giving has changed your life? Well, I'd love to hear from you. So I invite you to join this conversation. You can learn more about my work in this area at RodneyEricLopez.com. Thanks for watching The Generosity Solution. I'm Rodney Eric Lopez.